All right, I think we will get started. Uh, good afternoon to everybody that has joined us. We may have a few other people that will uh, pop in as we get started here, but uh, my name is Tom Formanak, and for those guests that are joining us today that may not know me, I'm the president and CEO of the Jenkins Automotive Group. The Jenkins Automotive Group is hosting this lecture today because our owner, Mr. Don Jenkins, wanted to share this valuable health-related information with our employees as well as our customers in our communities. During today's lecture, you will hear, uh, pardon me, you will have the ability to use the chat function um, and ask Dr. Furman questions, which he will answer at the end of the session. Dr. Furman is a board-certified family physician, um, a nutritional researcher who specializes in preventing and reversing disease through nutritional and natural methods. He is the president of the Nutritional Research Foundation and author of seven New York Times bestsellers. Dr. Furman is also on the faculty of the Northern Arizona University Health Science Division. Uh, as one of the country's leading experts in nutritional and natural healing, He's appeared on hundreds of radio and television shows, including The Dr. Oz Show, Live with Kelly, Fox, CNN, The Today Show, Good Morning America, The Discovery Channel, and of course, The Food Network. Um, his own PBS television programs directly address the crisis of obesity and chronic disease plaguing America, and he has raised over $70 million to help support PBS stations nationwide. Dr. Furman also operates the Eat to Live Retreat in San Diego, where people come from all over the world to recover their health. To learn more, you can visit Dr. Furman at drfurman.com, a great resource to make um, healthy eating easy and also where it tastes delicious. And there goes my light. Um, and now uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Furman. Thank you, Tom and looking forward to talking to you all today. We had a lot of fun yesterday on this discussion too. The primary theme of this presentation is to let you know that you can take control of your health destiny and you don't have to have a heart attack or a stroke if you don't want to. You don't have to get cancer if you don't want to either. And the interesting thing is the same dietary portfolio, the same powerful effect of nutritional excellence to prevent cancer and prevent heart attacks and strokes is the same dietary portfolio that maximally protects aging of the brain and development of dementia when you get older. This is called a win-win because when you, when you use modern nutritional science, you have an unprecedented opportunity in human history to use what we've learned over the last 20 years to live better and healthier than ever before maintain your physical and your mental intellectual ability with late, in later age and live to be 95 to 105 years old in great health. We can really enjoy those golden years. Most Americans which pass away between 75 and 85, most Americans die around 78 years old, but they don't just pass away, they suffer when they die and they live for years with poor mental function, poor physical function, taking drugs, being uncomfortable, we have the worst healthy life expectancy of almost any modern industrialized country. We're not living longer and better than ever before due to modern medical care. That's a fallacy. Matter of fact, in 19, 1910, um, about 4% of the American population died of heart attacks and strokes, and now it's 40%. Things have gone, the, the cancer rates have gone up 500%. And out of the 75 medications, that have, been improved, that have been approved by the FDA to treat cancer in the last 15 years. With an average cost of $36,000 a shot for each course of drug, the amount of lifespan enhancement they've shown to give cancer patients average out at 2.4 months per, per $36,000 drug treatment. We've lost the war on cancer. The $105 billion we spent since, Nick, since Richard Nixon started the, this, um, to try to win the war on cancer, has shown that we're not gonna ever find a magic pill that's gonna wipe out cancer. We're gonna make you get cancer and then get well from it. 
They're just poisonous substances that kill cancer cells but damage the body. And then the cancer cells that escape the damage grow back and kill people when the cancer reoccurs. What I'm saying right now is there are slow growing, there are slow growing cancers and there are more rapidly growing cancers that may need, that may respond better to chemotherapy. But the, dis, but the discussion here is that we can prevent cancer and you can't expect the fact, you can't expect to smoke three packs a day that they're gonna invent some magic pill to enable you not to get lung cancer or to be able to eat pizza and donuts and bagels and white bread and, and croissants and french fries and burgers and chips and, and, and not get breast cancer or prostate cancer or colon cancer. I'm not gonna invent this magic pill. Life is not a fairy tale, it's real. And our bodies become what we ate in our lives and we are what we eat. And the message of hope you're gonna to hear today is that we could win the war. We've got this, it licked. I always say we've landed the man on the moon already. What I mean by that is we already have the technology to put a person on the moon. And we already have a technology so people don't have to get cancer. We have it done right now. The answer is vegetables. But people don't like that answer of vegetables. They want a different answer. They want like a, right? They don't like that. But what I'm telling you today right now is that this full dietary portfolio we're gonna to design today together with the most anti, with the foods that have scientific documented effects to prevent cancer. And you put a dietary portfolio together, including all these foods, it arms our immune system. So if we get sick with an infection, and in today's, when we know in today's COVID epidemic, many people are getting badly ill from COVID and even dying from it, right? And it doesn't have to happen. Every one of those people dying for, from COVID is because their immune systems are, are not working properly and because they're eating poorly and they're eating the standard American diet, which begets 40% of people dying of heart attacks and strokes and 30% dying of cancer. If you eat the way other Americans eat, you get what other Americans get and that you become sickly and you suffer in life tremendously. So this talk today is gonna give you powerful information so you don't have to fear COVID anymore. If your immune system is working properly and the only way your immune system can work properly is if you feed it with the right nutrients and the right foods. So let's get started. Of course, the underlying theme of this presentation is that heart disease is not natural. Cancer is not natural. These pre, these. These, are, these deaths are from nutritional ignorance, nutritional stupidity, and following the way other Americans eat. And we're kind of like socialized to become food addicts because we're eating foods that have been designed by companies that put into the food things that want to attract you and get you hooked on those foods. It's, legal, it's, it's, it's like legal drug addiction because the food is like drug and it gets people so they can't even think of changing their food. I know some of you listening to me talk may be thinking, oh yeah, right, I'm gonna eat healthy. I'd rather, but if I had to eat carrot sticks and celery or, and lettuce to eat health, to be healthy, I'd rather be dead, just shoot me right now. I'd rather be, who wants to live if you have to eat like that? See, that's the, that's the addictive part of your brain talking because there's some resistance of the primitive brain for the smoker doesn't wanna give up their cigarettes. Part of them just looking for an excuse. My son, you know, got in a, um, you know, my husband lost his job. My son got in a car accident, too much stress in my life. The addict always turns to their illicit relationships with drugs, alcohol, or food in order to try to think that's gonna help them solve their problems or deal with their stress. And it's a very dysfunctional relationship because using food and alcohol and drugs never solves your problems, never reduces your stress, just, can, just makes it more complicated and makes your stress worse and makes you unable to deal with your problems in life and solve them. So we're gonna show you how to make food taste, healthy food taste fantastic, make you love eating this way and live your life with gusto, excitement and confidence that you're not gonna to have to worry about getting sick because the body is a miraculous self-healing machine. It's not supposed to get these diseases when fed properly. And I'm also saying something else here. I'm saying that the same diet style designed for nutritional excellence to maximally extend human lifespan without just getting diseased. That same diet style is also therapeutically most effective to reverse disease. When people have asthma, they can get well from that. When they have autoimmune urticaria and skin rashes, they can get well from that. When they have psoriasis, it can go away. Their rheumatoid arthritis, their ulcerative colitis, 
their high blood pressure comes back to normal, their diabetes can go away, their heart disease, their chest pains can end, they can get off their blood pressure medications, they can become non-diabetic and off their diabetic medications. And I want to mention that if you eat the way other Americans eat, you get what, America, what other Americans get because most Americans are overweight. Right? Uh, the uh, authorities tell us that about 70% of Americans are overweight. But we know that's not really true because they use a BMI, BMI of 25 as the demarcation line between a normal weight and overweight. And all long-lived societies, all the blue zones where people live the longest, always have BMIs below 23. Maximum lifespan occurs for males with BMIs below 22 and for females with a BMI below 21. So when we move the demarcation line from 25 to 23 and to classify overweight people, then we find 89% of Americans are overweight, not 70%. Almost all Americans are overweight. Even if you look at the 10% or 11% that are not overweight, the majority of those people are sick or addicts. They're smokers or alcoholics. They're people with depression, autoimmune conditions, occult cancers, digestive disorders, autoimmune conditions. We're seeing people that are naturally sick, which is keeping them thin. If the smokers are thin, it means that if, if you're healthy, if they were healthy, they would have stopped smoking. They would have been overweight like everybody else. If you eat American food, you become overweight. It's only 2.4% of Americans, 2.4% have a BMI below 23 because they eat healthfully, relatively healthfully, and exercise regularly. Health care is self-care, and it's not magic. You're in charge of your health, and only you can protect your health. You know what they say, only you can, protect, can prevent forest fires. It's the same thing. Nobody can do this except you. You can't buy it in a bottle, and you can't get it by going to doctors. Now, nutrition, food gives us nutrients. And the two types of nutrients we get from food are macronutrients and micronutrients. Now, macronutrients are those nutrients that give us calories, like fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And the micronutrients are those foods that are those parts of foods, the nutrients in foods that don't have calories in them, but support immune function and protect our DNA and our cell structure against breakdown and disease. Think of it this way. You build up more toxins, poisons in your tissues, like free radicals and reactive oxygen species, the type of free radical build up inside of humans, and other toxins like, like um, advanced glycation end products, which, are, which damages the cell surfaces and the in, interior and build up inside cells. So we, have, so we build up more waste products in a cell, obviously, then you're going to get sicker. When you build up more nutrients, more phytochemicals, more antioxidants that keep reactive oxygen speed and help the cell detoxify and keep the toxins, the poisons out of the cell, then the cell enhances its natural repair mechanisms, fix the DNA crosslinks, remove methylation defects that if accumulated could lead to cancer, and keep the cell working properly and clean. So, my, so having a diet rich in micronutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, phytonutrients are all are particularly important here. What I'm saying right now, which I want you to remember this and write this down, is the primary principle of a nutritarian diet, and I call the super healthy way of eating a nutritarian diet. And the foundational and most important principle here and the, is the only proven methodology to extend human lifespan. And that is five words here, Moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Those five words you have to know. You have to live it. Moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. Americans eat too much fat, they eat too much carbohydrate, and they eat too much protein. They become calorie consuming monsters because when your diet is deficient in phytochemicals and antioxidants, the brain doesn't get the turn off switch. And the addictive nature of processed foods stimulate dopamine receptors in the brain. And it drives you to eat more food. And because your body builds up toxins and free radicals, if you try to stop overeating, if you try to stop eating so frequently, you get fatigued and shaky and weak. You don't, you don't feel and headachey. You start to feel wiped out and spacey. You gotta keep eating food to keep your energy up. You have to chronically overeat just to feel normal because your diet is so deficient in nutrients. 
when you achieve micronutrient excellence, you feel great and you don't need to use food as a stimulant because you're not fatigued out and feeling wiped out and lack of concentration. You, you then become in tune with true hunger and you can eat when you're hungry, which is less frequently, and your body instinctually now desires the right amount of calories. All people that are overweight is not because they've stuffed themselves with too much food. It's not the main reason. The main reason is they've stuffed themselves with the wrong type of food. And because their body is nutritionally deficient, their body goes into overdrive, trying to eat that can't control their caloric drive, and the body is chronically desirous of more calories. They don't feel well until they continually stuff themselves with too many calories. So if you want to lose weight, you can't just willy-nilly cut back on calories. You have to eat the right foods because then reducing calories is more comfortable and becomes desirable for you. So H equals N over C is my health equation, which means your healthy life expectancy, how the quality of your life in your later years and how healthy you're going to be and how resistant to disease you're going to be is all based on the micronutrient bang, the nutrient bang per caloric buck you get through your life. And that means you eat foods that are high in nutrients like green vegetables and strawberries and beans and mushrooms and onions. When you eat foods that have a lot of micronutrients in them, they suppress the appetite. They interfere with fat storage and they make you satisfied with less, and they take up space in your stomach and make you satisfied with less food. The secret to losing weight and keeping it off is eating lots of this health supporting food, which will crowd out the bad stuff, but also bring, back, bring you back health and remove your, that calorie consuming monster, remove that addictive drive to overconsume calories. So the first principle of a nutritarian diet means you have to eat a diet that's really healthy, that contains a lot of healthy food. And when you do that, when you eat a diet with lots of nutrients in it, and you grab weight gravitates towards a healthy weight. And a nutritarian is at a healthy weight, or they're gravitating towards that with time. In other words, you're not a nutritarian if you're overweight and you're staying overweight. All overweight people are sickly. All overweight people are in danger because being overweight is an abnormal pathologic condition because fat cells don't have a good blood supply. They have poor penetration of blood. So they build up more free radicals, more inflammation. They keep the white blood cells activated. They keep inflammation chronically high in your body. They keep your response to infection to be a, an overly inflamed condition. And they spew out lipokines and cytokines and other inflammatory substances, which excite the enzyme aromatase. So you produce more estrogen now, which increases risk of breast and prostate cancer. And the fat cells also promote angiogenesis because they're calling out for blood vessels. Angiogenesis means the growth of new blood vessels. There are certain foods that stimulate the growth of new blood vessels, like sweets, for example, that raises insulin. But when you're overweight, you become insulin resistant because fat cells block the uptake of insulin, particularly saturated fat too. We need animal products with animal fats in them. Those saturated fats distort the insulin receptor and make you now when you eat a mango or some oatmeal, you get a higher amount of glucose in the bloodstream and a higher amount of insulin needs to be produced to get the glucose out because your insulin receptors have been blocked by the saturated fat from the animal products you need or the butter or whatever. What I'm saying right now is that when you're overweight, your body has to produce a higher amount of insulin because it sees a higher glucose load coming in because the body is, um, because the fat cells aren't permitting the glucose to go into the blood set, the cells rapidly. They're slowing it down. The body has to produce more insulin to get it out of the blood. This combination between this high glycemic diet Americans eat with foods that are like white flour and sugar and honey and maple syrup, all these sweets where sugar is rushing to the bloodstream rapidly, then require a huge amount of insulin to be produced, especially when you're overweight. And that insulin promotes angiogenesis. Insulin is a fat storage hormone. It stops you from losing weight. And it permissively allows cancer cells to replicate simultaneously because when insulin rises in promoting angiogenesis and, and growth of fat, it's allowing cells to replicate um, excessively, promoting the growth of cancer at the same time. A nutritarian is a person who's obviously at their normal weight. We're talking about a BMI below 23, below 22 for a male, below 21 for a female ideal. We're also, which, is, which corresponds to an ideal weight for a male is with a body fat below 15% and with a female, 
a body fat below 25% of body, body weight being fat. Ideally, it would be below 22.5% for a female and below, below 125 for a male. Which categories almost everybody is being overweight. Or if you're a nutritarian, if you're overweight and you're losing weight at the rate of at least two pounds a week, when you're losing a kilogram or 2.2 pounds a week, we find that people's insulin resistance goes down. The aromatase excitation goes down. Production of angiogenesis promoters goes down. The inflammation starts to go down. Most people are overweight. Maybe most people listening to this are overweight. And if they are, they can immediately establish a high degree of protection from heart disease and even from COVID if they start eating healthfully and dropping weight at least two pounds a week. We know when people go through gastric bypass surgery or lap band placement and they're dropping weight rapidly, their diabetes goes away in the first few weeks. They still could be overweight and they don't need diabetic medications anymore because they're losing weight. The same thing we see here. When you follow a healthy diet and you're dropping weight, your blood pressure is improving, your diabetes parameters are improving, and your inflammatory parameters are improving that increase your risk of having a, a dangerous response to an infection like COVID are improving. Immediately in a few weeks, you're in a safer position, even if you're still overweight, because you're steadily dropping weight. The minute you stop dropping weight and you level off at an overweight weight, you start to see the inflammation go back up again. You have to keep losing. And you, all you have to do is keep following this diet, a Terry program, which will have you keep losing and adjust your intake of food appropriately to make sure you lose at least two pounds a week. When you do this moderate caloric restriction, which takes no effort, because when you eat beans, 100 calories of beans, you feel like you ate 100 calories. It's feel very filling. And then 100 calories don't even come into the bloodstream because beans are so high in resistant starch that they're, all the calories are, don't get digested. When you eat nuts and seeds as your source of fat, you may eat 100 calories of nuts and seeds and your appetite was turned down by 100 calories of nuts and seeds. But, you don't even feel, but they don't all come into the body because the sterols and stanols bind fat so tightly, they carry those fats out into the stool, the toilet bowl. And even though you felt like you ate 100 calories, you really didn't get all that calories in. When you're eating vegetables, even salads, all the vegetables are all the calories are not biologically absorbable. What I'm saying right now is when you eat the right type of food and the right foods, it's almost impossible to become overweight. You feel satisfied and you still lose weight. It's eating the wrong foods that made you overweight, not eating too much of the right foods. You don't have to eat thimble-sized portions of food. Have all the frozen artichoke hearts you want and eat you know, eggplant dips and hummus dips and we can eat all types of healthy, delicious things. When you do that, you enhance cellular repair and you, you enable the body to suppress the genetic weaknesses that people have, the genetic alterations that could have led to cancer, increased your risk of cancer, like the GSTP1 gene or the BRCA gene in women that can increase risk of breast and ovarian cancer is suppressed and unable to be expressed in the current context of a high green diet, which contains all these protective nutrients in it. And also you slow down the metabolic rate. The metabolic rate is the rate at which you're aging. It's how you're running your furnace. It's how fast your foot's on the gas pedal driving your car. And the faster and hotter you run your furnace, the more you burn out your lifespan. In other words, let's use my body as an example. I weigh about 150 pounds. And let's just say for argument to make this analogy simple, let's just say I need about 1500 calories a day for my basal metabolic needs. Now, what if I eat 200 calories extra over what I need each day? Maybe it's 1,700 what I need instead of 1,500. Well, it's 100 calories. It's a 3,500 calories per pound of body fat. So if I ate an extra 100 calories a day, so I'm 350 days a year, if 200 calories, that would be that would be 20 pounds of body fat at the end of the year I would gain, right? But no, it's wrong. I won't gain 20 pounds. I won't gain 10 pounds. You know why? Because as you overeat calories, your body will fight the, the, the um, deposition of fat. It'll try to retard the deposition of fat on the body by trying to speed up the metabolism. So more calories means more meta, a higher metabolic rate. Your body will raise its body temperature. It'll increase its thyroid production. It'll, it'll um, accelerate and raise the respiratory quotient, the amount of calories burned through breathing. The body will set into motion a series of events that tries to burn off the extra calories that you're eating when you're eating extra calories. But in doing so, you're, you're, a, you're aging your stem cells and your telomeres. So now if you measured your telomere length for this person that's chronically overeating, when they're 50 years old, their telomeres look like a 70-year-old person. 
you're making a pact with the devil when you're overeating, trying to raise your metabolic rate. When you under eat calories a little bit, if I was 100 calories under my 1,500 needs a day, I wouldn't lose 10 pounds because I'm already at, my body fat's only 11%. My body is already is gonna resist and because I exercise regularly and I, my body has a signal to exercise that I use the muscles so that it so tells my body he needs to and wants to maintain this degree of muscle mass. So my body will purposely try to slow down my metabolism by lowering the body temperature and lowering thyroid function and lowering the respiratory quotient to try to reduce the caloric burn so my body will maintain this degree of muscle mass. It'll resist losing weight. So by undershooting my calories, maybe I just drop two pounds the year, not 10 pounds. The biological mechanism my body puts into motion to try to prevent weight loss with moderate caloric restriction is slowing my metabolism down, stabilizing the telomeres, enhancing stem cell maintenance, and extending my lifespan. It's a myth that people, people out there in the comic book think nutritional world, you know, read, reading magazines and things, think that they, they're looking for ways to speed up their metabolic rates so they can eat more food and not get fat. There's no such magic. Anything that can speed up your metabolic rate is, doing, is going to accelerate the aging process. What you want to do is slow down your metabolic rate so you can eat less food and not get too thin. We're trying to eat as little as we can without getting thin, too thin different way of thinking about things right here. This is very, very critical to pick the right foods because for every 100 calorie increase in metabolic rate from the overeating, the risk of death increases by 25%. Studies show also that people will run in the normal range of thyroid, in the normal range, the bottom half of normal, has half the heart attack rate as people in the top half of normal, which is important to remember if you're taking thyroid medications, not to take so much that you push yourself in the top half. Keep yourself in the bottom half where people, what's, what's really normal. Just like eating a nutritarian diet that's so rich in these um, healthful plants, keeps the inflammation down and keeps your white blood cells so low that they're outside of the normal range. The normal range is five to 10. Us nutritarians have, blood, have white blood cell counts, you know, 2.5, 3.2, 3.8, 4.1. You know, we're keep outside, low below normal because we don't need it, the extra white blood cells because we don't have all that inflammation. You go to your doctor, he sees your blood cell count so low, and he says, oh, I have to send you to an oncologist for a bone marrow biopsy. He doesn't recognize what a healthy person looks like because he himself and all his patients are so unhealthy. And you say to him, it's you that need the bone marrow biopsy, not me. A white blood cell count of, of three is normal. It's even better than normal. It's excellent. He doesn't understand that because he never sees, he doesn't even know what a normal person looks like. And if I ask you, what food protects against cancer the most? Your answer is raw green vegetables. And I ask you what food protects against dementia the most? Your right answer should be raw green vegetables. And I ask you what protects against heart attacks the most? Your answer is raw green vegetables. A review of more than 200 studies show that raw vegetables have the most powerful and consistent association with protection of cancers of all type. And also showed the best effect on re increasing blood vessel elasticity, reducing endothelial inflammation, preventing heart attacks, accelerating reversal of atherosclerosis, and otherwise protecting your heart and improving and reducing heart attack and stroke risk. My mantra is, have every day people should have a, a one big salad, preferably for lunch. A big, large salad as a main dish, at least once a day. Maybe it's a chopped salad, you put some cruciferous greens in there raw, like arugula or bok choy or kale or shredded cabbage on top, and you use some of the allium family, the onion family, like with a little red onion or scallion on the salad. You get all this full portfolio of anti-cancer nutrients. And then you use a dressing, not based with, not oil and vinegar based, but a dressing made with nuts that were blended, maybe an, maybe an peeled orange with some cashews and toasted sesame seeds and some blood orange vinegar and squeezes of lemon. Maybe some garlicky tomato sauce with some almond butter and black figure balsamic or balsamic or pomegranate balsamic vinegar on there. And a little hint of, you know, we, in other words, we make delicious dressings to make the salads taste great, but the dressings are healthy in themselves. There's a huge difference here between eating oil as a source of fat and eating nuts and seeds as your source of fat. That's another critical hallmark of a nutritarian diet is that we get our fat from nuts and seeds from the walnut, not the walnut oil, 
from the sesame seed, not the sesame oil, from the avocado, not the avocado oil, from the olive, not the olive oil, from the, we eat the whole food. And we might blend that to make a dressing or a sauce because Americans are overweight because they consume so much oil. The average American eats 400 to 500 calories of oil a day. There's no way you cannot be overweight doing that. No way. Unless, of course, you're a professional athlete or you're a physical laborer or you're a, a farmer carrying a, a 700 pound plow behind an ox eight hours a day, working in the fields all day long with physical labor. And you're not gonna burn that extra calories, mostly sitting all day long. There's no way. When you eat nuts and seeds, the calories are absorbed very slowly over a period of hours. So the body can preferentially burn them for, or for your, burn them for your calories, for energy. When you take in the oil, it's absorbed in a minute. They say from the lips to the hips in five minutes flat because oil is absorbed so rapidly. When it's absorbed so rapidly, the flux of, of calories in the bloodstream all at once. The same thing happens when you eat sugar and sweets and honey and maple syrup. The flux of calories in the bloodstream is such a large bolus entering the bloodstream all at once. That's what signals dopamine in the brain to make you an overeating monster, a calorie consuming monster, makes you into a food addict. Eating these foods that are rapidly absorbed into the bloodstream so fast. Fast food is not just food you eat at a fast food restaurant, but food that can be accessed fast and eaten fast and absorbed into the bloodstream fast. And that's what make, makes people overweight and makes them crazy into food addicts. Oil is an addictive substance that drives people to overeat. It's an appetite stimulant. And it's incredibly fattening at the same time. The minute you take an oil and the calories rush into the bloodstream so rapidly, that signals the body to store fat. If you're signaling the body to store fat, you're not taking fat off. You're not going to lose weight for days if you're putting oil on your food. And you're adding calories that push you over the level for you and start to speed up your metabolism and age you faster. What I'm saying right now is that olive oil causes breast and prostate cancer. I'm making the radical, uh, hard to believe I'm making such a radical statement that olive oil is a contributor to breast cancer. And the reason I can make that statement with accuracy is because olive oil is a large contributor to people's fat around they carry around their waist. Olive oil is a big contributor to people's being overweight and overweight people are increased risk of these, of, of these hormonally sensitive cancers like breast and prostate cancer. So being overweight increased use of cancer and if you took the olive oil out, you may not be overweight. That's why I can say that statement with accuracy. Vegetables on the other hand, have an incredible effect at protecting against cancer, right? These vegetables repair the broken cross links, remove the methylation defects. For example, in the study on Fiji Islanders who smoke like fiends, showed that the islanders, because they Fiji and they Fiji, they ate so much green vegetables in Fiji, they hardly get lung cancer, even the fact they smoke, where they compared them against the, the Hawaiian island, islanders, another Polynesian group who don't smoke much, but don't eat as much green vegetables and have higher rates of lung cancer, even though they don't smoke as much. More green vegetables, less cancer. Less green vegetables, more cancer. Not that hard to remember. In fact, vegetables and green vegetables are the most protective foods you can eat on the dietary landscape. All colorful vegetables as a whole, tomatoes, peppers, carrots, parsnips, green vegetables, eggplants, any kind of cauliflower, white, any color vegetables, only 2% of the American diet. The food, the scientific studies show are most protective against life-threatening against life diseases and cancer are foods that Americans hardly even eat. Should be most of what we eat should be vegetables. And the foods that have almost just a source of calories with no significant nutrient load is what we mostly eat. In other words, what I'm saying right now is that a bagel is just like a piece of chicken. And why am I saying a bagel is like a piece of chicken? Well, I'm saying that because both the bagel and the chicken are sources of macronutrients. You know, like the bagel has a lot of carbohydrate. And the chicken has a lot of animal protein, but there's no significant micronutrient load there. They're not high in vitamins and minerals. They're not, they don't have antioxidants and phytochemicals that protect cancer. You're just getting macronutrients with an insignificant micronutrient load. They're both examples of foods that accelerate your death. We want to eat less processed foods we're and less animal products. We're dividing foods into three categories here. Animal products, processed foods, and produce or natural whole plant foods. And the secret to living a long life 
is reducing or eliminating processed foods and animal products and filling up your plate with unprocessed plant foods that have colors in them. And that includes making, getting rid of the oil. These nutrient scores or nutrient IQ scores just make it a visual aid to show you that a cup of kale or broccoli or lettuce or even tomatoes and mushrooms are full of nutrients. These nutrients are measured by the US government, 36 different nutrients, very high. Whereas when you start to eat you know, white rice and white bread and oils, you get almost no nutrients, you just get pure calories. This idea people have that pure calories with no significant micronutrient load is good for them because just because olive oil is healthier than butter or olive oil might be safer than eating white bread or eating candy, doesn't mean it's good for you. Of course, you know, white bread is candy. Americans eat the cake diet because white bread is cake. The body doesn't differentiate from eating sugar and cake from eating white flour. White flour turns into sugar in the bloodstream. You eat it, it's sugar in the blood. Raises your glucose in the blood, just same as you ate sugar. You might as well just, eat, you might as well just take a, a bowl of sugar and just eat it with a spoon if you're gonna have bagels and pizza. The pizza is cake. It's cake with cheese on top. The cake diet, they have, people have cake, they have this puff cereal or, or they have a pancake or a muffin for breakfast or a bagel for breakfast, it's just cake. And what's a muffin is a piece, a little piece of cake with no icing on top or something, it's crazy. And then they have a the lunch, they have you know, um, a burger with, with a burger bun, which is cake, with a piece of meat with cake, or pasta and meatballs, or meatballs with cake, with pasta just made of white flour, which is another form of eating cake, or they have something where they put, a, you know, it's craziness. And they may have some white rice, which is just like, which is just the same as eating sugar too, with, a, with a hardly any vegetables, with some oil, fry some oil in the potato. When you cook oil at high heat over time, not only is the oil fattening, it becomes rancid, it's carcinogenic. Go to a fast food restaurant, you're not gonna get something for nothing. You're paying for fast food, you're paying for years off your life, you're paying for an earlier death, and you're paying for medical conditions that are gonna strip you of your money and your well-being in your later years. Fast food isn't cheap, it's expensive. You kill, it's expensive because it makes you spend now all your money and effort on medical care and your life becomes living hell when you eat fast food. When you eat these vegetables like raw vegetables in a salad or cooked green vegetables like cooked string beans or Brussels sprouts or artichokes or asparagus, they're all super low in calories, less than 100 calories a pound. You can't fit that many calories in the stomach at one time. Mushrooms, eggplant, tomatoes, peppers, cauliflower. Eat, you, don't eat, you can eat large portions of food, making it taste great with delicious sauces, a Thai curry sauce or a Mexican Olay or some kind of, you know, you can make incredibly delicious sauces, make incredibly delicious salad dressings. These things are naturally low in calories. And you're... Your apostat, the calories you prefer to eat, are also controlled by the, con by the content of fiber and resistant starch in your diet. The fiber and resistant starch promotes the growth of good bacteria in the gut. And the bacteria break down the fiber into short-chain fatty acids, predominantly butyrate, which then controls the apostat in the hypothalamus, wanting you, making you want to eat less food. So your appetite's controlled by many different things, including the stretch receptors, the nutrient receptors, the amount of fiber, the butyrate the signals in the hypothalamus, right? And then you trigger these volume receptors. When you eat oil or animal products, they're so calorically rich, you can put a lot of calories into the stomach because they're not triggering those, they're, they're not triggering the hypothalamus to stop eating and they're not triggering nutrient receptors or stretch receptors. When you put a lot of vegetables in there, you know, maybe an intact whole grain, farro, quinoa, you know, cabbage, cooked vegetables, raw vegetables, salads, vegetable soups, beans, when you put, you can't fit that many calories in because they occupy too much space. And that's how you know, using science and logic, that Skipper never really lived on that island. You know what I mean by that? You know, some of you may be too young, but it's an old show, he was on this island where the overweight Skipper was shipwrecked on an island for years when he was, but just a joke. By the way, if you laugh at my jokes, you live longer. If you laugh, just laughing makes you live longer. And smiling makes you live longer. It's good for your body, good for your health. And a joke doesn't even have to be funny. Just laugh anyway and smile anyway. Just do that. Just add it a, just add it a year to your life. It's funny because I was on my PBS television show. 
I said in one of my earlier shows, I said, I showed the American dietary pie. And I said, this diet's been designed by Al Qaeda to kill us. And they cut it out. They dubbed over it and they wrote and they put instead, they had a different voice come on. And they said, this diet's been designed by, and then a voice came on and said, Darth Vader. I said, come on, that's not funny. That makes me look stupid. It's not even a funny joke. This diet's been designed by Darth Vader. But of course, it doesn't matter. People laugh or whatever they got to just slap anyway. All right, G-bombs, moving on to G-bombs are the foods that we're talking about have the most scientific support and the most data collected to show they have powerful anti-cancer effects. And I have this acronym G-bomb, so you remember these foods, these critical, most important foods that maximally protect you against cancer. And we started to talk about some of these foods already, and they are green vegetables, beans of all different types, red beans, black beans, white beans, soybeans, all of them have powerful anti-cancer effects. The onion family, of course, onions, scallions, and leeks, and garlic, mushrooms of all types. Berries have tremendous anti-cancer effects and other low sugar fruits like loquats and kumquats and, and passion fruit and, you know, and even some citrus fruits particularly. And in other words, pomegranates, these berries are particularly superfoods and seeds like flax seeds and chia seeds, sesame seeds, are full of lignans and other anti-cancer substances in them. So we're trying to have people eat a big salad every day. Maybe, maybe your lunch should be a salad and a bowl of vegetable and bean soup with mushrooms in it that you made on the weekend. You can make this big pot of soup on the weekends and you can put carrot juice in there and put lots of, and blend some onion into the base of the soup and put in chopped carrots and green vegetables and, and put into your soup lots of chopped mushrooms, maybe some zucchini, cook beans in there, you know, you make this big pot, you put spices and flavorings in there and you put, make this big soup pot of soup on the weekends. Then you put it out, it's like five containers, you can eat it all right week long. The point I'm making is here, is if everybody in the country ate a big salad with a nut and seed based dressing and a bowl of vegetable bean soup with mushrooms and onions in it and a piece of fruit or some fruit for dessert, wow, just if everybody had this big healthy lunch of salad, soup and piece of fruit, we'd revolutionize healthcare. We'd save half of healthcare costs. We'd put most doctors out of business just if people change their lunches. Lunch is the most important meal of the day. People are away from their house. They're tempted by restaurant or fast foods. It keeps them active. You burn more calories during the day anyway. Eating food late at night is more likely to put on as fat. We should be eating a lighter and earlier dinner anyway. We get rid of, we wouldn't even need so many doctors, emergency rooms and hospitals. Half those doctors can become plumbers and electricians and librarians and they can drive Ubers. I don't know what they'll do. The point of course, is that you're not gonna get by good health by getting better medical care. Matter of fact, the, the um, Accord study showed that People who are diabetics, they put them with better and more medical care to follow their glucoses more carefully and get more medications appropriately to lower their sugar in a more favorable range. And the government had to step in and stop the study because the people were dying more compared to the people getting less care because the more drugs meant more death. Because you push the failing beta cells to work harder to produce more insulin, lower blood sugar, and the person becomes more diabetic and accelerates their death. And these drugs make you gain weight anyway. There's no substitute for eating right. You can't buy yourself into good health. If you have type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetic, I say don't treat it, get rid of it, become non-diabetic as fast as possible. And you can do it. It's easy to do. Go to a doctor, nobody's mentioning that you can even do these things. They're just going to give you drugs and, think, and give you this impression. If you have high blood pressure, you're going to take this drug for the rest of your life and you're never going to get well. If you take this drug for the rest of your life and never going to get well, then you're most likely going to die of something related to your heart, heart disease because you're, you're going to continue to advance because you're, of course, eating the same diet you were eating to be, that caused the problem to begin with. And now the drug is an enabler. The doctor becomes an enabler. He's giving you a, I call the prescription pad, a permission pad. Because now that your blood pressure just looks better, you think it's okay to eat the same diet, which makes your underlying pathology just get worse. Maybe in, next year you're going to be on two drugs and you're going to be on three drugs to lower your blood pressure. Your death is accelerated because you think you're okay because doctors are treating the blood test, they're treating the blood pressure, and you think you're okay because the numbers look a little better. You're treating what you can measure with a hundred unmeasurable factors are advancing and getting worse because you didn't change the way you ate. If you never had those drugs, maybe doctors would be forced to pick you up in the air and by the neck and smack your head against the wall and say, I wanna see you here next week. 
five pounds lighter. Walk for an hour each morning and start eating salad every day and have a big, have some ber- oats and berries for, at the dinner time and have a, you know, have some wicked, walked Chinese Asian vegetable dish or something for, you know, he'd be giving it, he'd be telling you what to do, but instead we just simply, the doctor just writes you a dr- drug prescription and hands it to you so you can go on and die and, can, and f- accelerate your death. It's like, it's, it's the, in, the inherent methodology that doctors utilize is on its basis malpractice because people are not properly informed. Informed consent means they have to know what caused them to be sick and their options to get well. You don't just give them a drug and think that's the only thing they should do when there's better options. This is a little review slide right here. We're pausing for a second because what I'm saying right now is that your body controls the rate at which you age and it does so via numerous mechanisms. One is, one is it produces longevity proteins like CERT1 and AMP kinase, which stabilize our telomeres. Telomeres age, and the faster your telomeres are aging, the faster you're aging. At 50 years old, maybe, you're, maybe at 50 years old, your telomeres show that you're really about 65. And maybe if you change your diet two or three years later, at 55 years old, your telomeres will show you're 45 because you ate all these phytochemical rich foods, you exercise regularly and you moderately caloric restrict. The major way you age slower, the major way you fix the shortening of your telomeres and restore and maintain your stem cells so they're there to replenish and help you as you age is by eating a diet high in phytochemicals, getting regular exercise and moderate in conjunction with moderate caloric restriction. And the high intake of vegetables, beans and mushrooms and onions and berries and seeds naturally makes you feel like you ate enough food and it naturally keeps you thin. Whereas on the opposite, there are, there are proteins and body produces certain substances that accelerate your death. There's a mTOR is elevated and a hundred percent of invasive cancers, mTOR is elevated. And mTOR drives angiogenesis, the promotion of blood vessels, which then make you put on more fat and allows cancer cells to replicate. And it accelerates stem cell loss and, and more stress and more um, oxidative stress and more cell proliferation and growth accelerating cancer. And what do you think drives mTOR and drives cell proliferation and drives those hormones that lead you to an early death? Or, of course, high, high amount of animal protein, a lot of animal products in your diet, and eating high glycemic carbohydrates and overeating calories in general. We're... We're talking about this second principle of a nutritarian diet. You remember the first principle, of course, right? The first principle is moderate caloric restriction in the context of micronutrient excellence. The second principle of a nutritarian diet is your diet has to be hormonally favorable. And we're already talking about how fat cells drive higher levels of estrogen and how high, eating high glycemic carbohydrates like honey and maple syrup and white rice and white bread and white potato drive high amounts of insulin. We touched on the fact going into it now in more detail, that as you eat too much animal products or animal protein, it drives up a growth hormone called IGF-1, stands for insulin-like growth factor one. And insulin-like growth factor one is also a a hormone that promotes, promotes growth and promotes angiogenesis and promotes cellular replication like insulin. Very carefully and linked in the scientific studies to higher rates of cancer, no controversy high, that higher levels of IGF-1 are linked to higher rates of breast and prostate cancer. And we know what predominantly drives animal pro- IGF-1 is animal protein. IGF-1 binds to the insulin receptor and is a fat storage hormone too, like insulin. Insulin is affected by animal protein too, but not as much as sweets and sugar. IGF-1 is affected by sugar too, but not as much as animal protein. Don't forget the glycemic load of the food is not how much glucose it puts in the bloodstream. It's how much glucose it puts in the bloodstream in the short period of eating that food. In other words, how fast the glucose enters the bloodstream. The faster the glucose enters the bloodstream, the higher the glycemic load and the more insulin that's produced and the more stimulation of dopamine and the more you become want to overeat calories. When you eat foods that put sugar into the bloodstream, like a bean, over a three hour period, it's only kind of glucose is only coming in at one or two calories a minute. There's no subsequent rise in insulin that's needed and the body can preferentially burn that for energy. Just like when your body eats nuts and seeds as your source of fat, 
You're not putting all the fat in it once. Your body can preferentially burn it for energy during the day. You're not revving up fat storage hormones or fat storage mis messages and signals. If you have oil and you're eating oil or animal fat or greasy food, it immediately stores fat and you're revving up fat storage hormones. We know that glycemic load is not controversial, that all nutritional scientists recognize that when you eat more high glycemic load meals, right, then you're going to have a higher rate of diabetes and heart disease and cancers, as well as dementia. And of course, body fat makes it worse. A white potato becomes more insulin production, more glycemically unfavorable when you're, when you're overweight. And the more you eat saturated fats, the more you block insulin resistance and the, and the growth of unfavorable bacteria in the digestive tract. For example, we know that these people on these paleo or keto diets who say, look, I can't eat a mango or oats because I have to stay eating mostly meat because when I eat a mango or some oats, my sugar gets too high. Yeah, but that's because you're on all this high, high saturated fat, high IGF-1 producing food and you've developed insulin resistance. You've damaged your insulin receptors. So of course you can't eat the, the, the carbohydrates, push your sugars too high. If you were eating right, you would be able to eat those foods without your sugars going too high. There's a lot of myths and ig ignorance being promoted in the nutritional community. But we know we give more credence to studies that go on for decades with large numbers of people. And look at hard endpoints. A hard endpoint is something like death or a heart attack. And we have, a, we have all the studies that are done that look at large numbers of people and follow them for many decades show that it's not just animal products that are bad or just processed foods or high glycemic carbohydrates that are bad. It's both of them are bad. They both accelerate your death. All the studies show more animal products means more death and more processed foods mean more death. And more vegetables means less death. It's always the old studies always show the same thing. People think, oh, the nutritional literature is so conflicted. It's all showing different things. Not true. You can pick a short term study to prove whatever you want to confuse people. Because I can feed you Twinkies or cookies and you'll, if I feed you less calories, you lose weight. And if you lose weight, maybe your triglycerides or diabetes will improve or something will look better in your bloodstream, like your cholesterol. But those short-term studies are only generate a hypothesis to see if the long-term studies are corroborated, corroborate the short-term studies to know whether we have a, or something real here or not. A person could try to trick you into thinking because there's some short-term study that showed one thing, but then if it failed in a long-term study, it was just a, um, it was just a what's the word, trick. You know, short-term studies are not definitive. The long-term studies actually give us the answer. A drug, new drug comes out. It looks favorable, but they only tested it on like a few hundred people. But then it got released to the general population and millions of people use the drug. And all of a sudden we find it causing heart attacks and when millions of people are using it, it's causing a lot of heart attacks. Take the drug off the market or give it a black box warning. We didn't see the real effect of that medication until it was released with a large number of people. It was not enough people involved and track them for enough years or enough decades to see the outcomes. So these high glycemic carbohydrates, carbohydrates are white, like white bread and white potato, you know, cake and, and these medium glycemic carbohydrate foods are like most high carbohydrate plant foods or, you know, like tropical fruits and potatoes and, and grains are medium glycemic load. And then the lowest glycemic load foods, of course, are beans and fresh fruits and citrus fruits and berries and squashes and parsnips and nuts are very low glycemic load. We want to eat enough of those low glycemic load foods and when we turn a a moderate glycemic load food into a low glycemic load food is eating our G-bombs because cooked mushrooms and cooked beans, and we should cook them. They're most favorable cooked. They build up good bacteria in the gut and raw green vegetables like lettuces and greens and raw onion and scallion help produce favorable bacteria in the gut. The combination of those two cooked foods and those two raw foods, having a diet when you utilize the, this dietary portfolio, supports the growth of favorable bacteria that then create this biofilm over the villi of your small intestines, thickens a gram-positive organism a favorable biofilm that now slow the absorption of the mango or the oatmeal you ate. The oatmeal or the mango become low glycemic because you regularly are a bean consumer with onions and mushrooms and your microbiome is so favorable. The right diet feeds the right microbiome. If we score various carbohydrates on a hierarchical scale of quality, we know that the beans have the most anti-cancer nutrients in them, and phytochemicals, 
like inositol pentakis phosphate, which protects against, which makes, which increases cell, abnormal cell apoptosis or abnormal cell death to attack and remove so your immune system can recognize and attack cells before they lead to cancer. But the beans have the highest amount of resistant starch and fiber, which means when you eat beans, all the calories don't come into the body. They mean you felt like you ate something that was heavy and gave you a lot of calories and you're not gonna be hungry for three or four hours. It's gonna last you, satisfy you for the whole day practically. But all those calories ultimately never even come into the body. Some of them are lost in the toilet bowl because the starches are resistant. It has, because beans have the most slowly digestible carbohydrates and the most resistant starch and the most fiber. They take away your appetite. They keep you energized all day and their calories are not absorbable. They, they lower your risk of diabetes and they're associated with longer life and lower rates of cancer. I'm not saying you can't eat any other carbohydrates, but you, if you're overweight or sickly, your major carbohydrate, diabetic, your major carbohydrate intake should be beans and the other ones should be moderated. We, right now, we're not advising people eat brown rice or white rice because white rice is too high, they're highly glycemic and brown rice is contaminated with arsenic. The Consumer Reports put out a big story on analyzing brown rice for the art and found it to be highly arsenic contaminated because the brown, the hull, or the brown part of the rice is what sucks up arsenic like a sponge more than any other grain does. And rice is the highest level of arsenic of all grains. So when we're using grains, we're using quinoa and farro and camu and other grains and not using much, not using rice. But beans are still the most favored grain, are the most favored carbohydrate, excuse me. Now IGF-1, I mentioned earlier, insulin like growth factor one, the lower levels of IGF-1 are associated with longer life. You know that vegans and vegetarians and, and athletes have lower levels. Healthier people have lower levels. The higher levels are, are promoted by people who are eating more animal products and more overweight. And lower levels decrease aging of the brain, make you age slower, and make you less insulin resistant. Higher levels, when you eat more animal products, especially dairy products, drive up IGF-1 into unfavorable ranges. That's why the countries that consume the most dairy always have the most breast cancer like the Scandinavian countries have high, and of course the United States and other countries a lot of dairy products. And milk drinking is associated in the long-term studies with higher rates of breast cancer. Very conclusive showing, many studies showing increased milk consumption increases risk of both prostate cancer in men and breast cancer in women. And it's very IGF-1 promoting. Whereas plant produce and plant proteins do not raise IGF-1 into unfavorable levels. The protein content of plant foods and the higher protein plant foods like beans and nuts and greens and quinoa and, med and pine nuts and sunflower seeds and all these hemp seeds and soybeans, all these high protein plant foods, a lot of them have more protein than meat. But the protein, because it's not biologically complete, doesn't push up IGF-1. The body makes, gets enough balanced protein from your total diet to produce sufficient IGF-1 but not to make excessive amounts. The minute you take in animal products and start to eat them above 10% of calories, we start to see IGF-1 ratcheting up very rapidly to higher levels. We can measure your IGF-1 to the number so specifically without even doing a blood test, we can just track the grams of animal protein you're eating each day. And we know how much you can dial up or down IGF-1 because more animal protein means more IGF-1 and you push it to a danger zone and most Americans are above 200. Run maybe between 200 and 250. 200 and 275, a danger zone of IGF-1, which is cancer promoting and permissive. The, um, the omega-3 talk, somebody put a question here about omega-3 versus omega-6 fatty acids. Yes, we're trying to people have an adequate amount of omega-3 fatty acids in their diet. Another reason is why adding oil to your food and being overweight completely obliterates the possibility of having a favorable omega-3 index. Because when you're overweight, you store so much fat on the body because you need at least 5% of your fats, of, your, um, of the fatty acids in your membranes of your cells to be omega-3 fatty acids versus omega-6. When you're overweight, eating, even taking fish oil or taking omega-3 fatty acids, when you have so much omegas, when you're so much fat that opposes that, you're not going to have a balance of omega-3 um, omega index above five. We want people to eat those omega-3 favorable nuts like walnuts, and hemp seeds and flax seeds and chia seeds. When I make a dressing and I'll put in like half pecans, I'll put in half hemp seeds or half cashews, I'll put in half hemp seeds. I'll put in, I'll try to get more of the omega-3 fatty acids in there. That's true, but it's not that critical. 
It doesn't have to be so exact because when you're not overeating, you're not storing the omega-6 on your body. Your body will store the omega-3 it needs. You're not taking all the omega-6. So the trick is, is, is to undershoot your calories and not have a lot of body fat. And for a vegan to make, it's very important for a vegan who's not eating frogs and snakes and salamanders and fish and that give you, and worms that give you omega-3 or wildy beast. That was a joke. The point I'm making here is that that you could get exposed to these omega-3 fatty acids like fish oil from fish, but the fish are contaminated today. We have micro, we, have, we dump thousands of tons of plastic into the ocean every hour. And the fish are now in microplastic breaks down and is consumed even by the small fish. Now the sardines are contaminated with microplastic and the scallops and even the fish along the shoreline are contaminated. It used to be the deep sea and the larger fish eating the smaller fish that had the high levels of mercury and PCBs, but now we have the small fish are contaminated and the average American has a credit card amount of microplastic in their body from eating seafood. You can't, seafood is no longer a, um, how should you say, a safe way to get your omega-3. On a vegan diet, it's safer not to eat fish for omega-3. I do recommend a vegan or a, or a laboratory algae derived of, um, DHA EPA supplement to make sure people's omega-3 index is above five. It's a good question because we know that, sh that we see cognitive impairment and brain shrinkage with aging from people whose omega-3 index is unfavorable. That's where you have to buy, have to eat right and be another reason why you have to eat right and be slim. And so you, the omega-3 you're taking in can stay on the blood cells and, you know, in, in the right ratio. So here's a, uh, obviously a slide showing omega pool data from many studies showing higher IGF-1 means higher rates of cancer. That's very well accepted in the medical literature. And we're talking about, you know, giving credence to studies like this, which, filed, which had more than 125,000 participants filed for an average of 25 years, classifying all these huge numbers of people into, how, into their dietary style of how much animal product they ate versus plant food. If their diet was largely vegan, they gave them the score of one. If their, largely, if their diet was largely animal product only, like a paleo, like a keto diet, like a high paleo keto diet or an Atkins diet, they gave them the score of 20. But most people fall in between. They weren't ones and they weren't 20. Most people were two or five or 14 or 11 or 12 or 16. And they found though, that over looking at hard endpoints, which was cardiovascular death in this study, at what age they died of heart attacks and how many heart attacks were observed, they found that as animal product intake went up, cardiovascular de deaths increased in direct proportion and lifespan, of course, was diminished. And as people moved to more plants and less animal products, they had enhancements in lifespan and lower cardiovascular death. What I'm saying right now, and I'm using the words here carefully, that all the long-term epidemiologic data using large numbers of people using hard endpoints like cancer, overall death, age of death, or cardiovascular death. All those studies show the same thing. And it's particularly highlighted by the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2. And the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study 2 study has so much credence and value as a study because they looked at people with a, all different dietary patterns, vegans and near vegans and flexitarians and pesco vegetarians and people who ate meat and people with more amount and less they, because the, the Seventh-day Adventist group and where they have this, the, um, the blue zone in Loma Linda, California, are a group of people generally live longer than the average American because they're generally eating healthy because the religion advocates healthy eating and exercise and lack of, and not, not drinking alcohol and smoking. And of course, advocates eating less or no animal products. And you have a whole different range of animal product consumption in this group. So instead of studying Americans who are eat or all the same, all eat 30 to 40% of calories from animal products, they were able to study groups to eat different amounts. And what they found with these large numbers of people over many decades, in other words, this study has been going on, these studies have been going on for, for more than 20 years, is they found that more animal protein made for more cardiovascular death and overall increased overall mortality and more plant high plant protein food made for longer life and less cardiovascular deaths. More animal protein, more death, more plant protein, lower deaths. And the vegan diets that, were, that didn't have nuts and seeds didn't do very well. That nuts and seed consumption was linked to a 39% reduction of cardiovascular death. Incredibly, but it was it's all corroborated by 17 other studies, which means it's meaningful because other studies showing the same thing. 
that nuts and seeds are tremendously protective against cardiovascular death and cancer death and all cause mortality. More plant foods, whole foods as your source of fat, longer life, more animal products, animal products as your source of protein and fat, shorter life, pretty clear. Here's a study on 134,000 Chinese adults showing the longest lived people, the people with most centenarians occurred in people in the highest quintile of green cruciferous vegetable consumption. More greens, more enhanced lifespan. More greens, more beans, more nuts and seeds overall lowers the glycemic load of your diet. And as you're eating more plants, lower glycemic plants, it modulates the glycemic load of your diet with the other higher glycemic foods you may be eating like mangoes and you know, pineapple and sweet potato or squashes. The point is, is we need this right balance. A nutritarian diet is designed with the full dietary portfolio, exposure to a wide variety of foods, giving you a much better nutritional exposure than a blue zone does. Blue zones live longer, but not anywhere near to the achievements that a nutritarian diet can give people. Don't forget here, of course, that, that when you're eating oil on your food, of course, and you're salting your food, and you're adding sugars and sweeteners to your food, like honey and maple syrup or stevia or monk fruit or xylitol or even low calorie sweeteners, they're appetite stimulants that make you want to overeat food. We're trying not just to eat right, we're also trying to avoid SOS, avoid sugar, salt, and oil. Avoid SOS, avoid sugar, salt, and oil. We're trying to avoid appetite stimulants that trigger addiction and overeating behavior. So this Nutritarian pyramid, or this Nutritarian diet is heavy on plant foods, but heavy on vegetables, different types of vegetables, lots of green vegetables and salad, eating a lot of cooked vegetables too, right? Carrots and tomatoes and tomato sauces and different dishes, you know, made with broccoli and artichokes and asparagus and peas, and then you can eat fruit and beans and some whole grains and nuts and seeds. And then you were greatly limiting animal products and trying to use processed foods rarely or a special occasion or hardly. But the point I'm making is that when you adapt to learning these delicious recipes and your taste buds change and accommodate them, and then you're, you're off all the highly salted and highly seasoned, highly palatable processed foods, your taste get, buds get healthier again. They get stronger. And now well, strawberry tastes more flavorful. And you can taste vanilla in lettuce and you can taste the vanilla, you taste more flavor. You enjoy like a delicious vanilla ice cream made with frozen banana, with real vanilla bean powder and a handful of walnuts or macadamia nuts blended together. Gives you an incredibly delicious mouthfeel. Not anywhere near as sweet as conventional ice cream. But you don't want the sweet ice cream anymore. You'd much prefer it because the sweet ice cream is designed to stimulate the brain to make you into an addict. It makes you want to eat the whole pint or the whole gallon. And it's not even sweet anymore because your taste buds have been so deadened and you're, and you're deadening your, you're building up tolerance for this stuff. And now, now healthy foods don't have any flavor. Now you can't text, taste all the texture and flavor in real food. Strawberries, a cashew nut doesn't have a unique delicious flavor. It's flat tasting. An avocado has no flavor and, and greens have no flavor. And asparagus and artichokes have no flavor. You gotta douse everything with salt and spice because nothing has flavor anymore. Because you've deadened your health and you've deadened your taste buds. A new, you're gonna learn the most delicious recipes designed by myself and famous world-class chefs that join me and support me with great tasting food. And as you do this and your health improves, your taste buds are going to improve and you're gonna enjoy this diet more than your old diet. And then the magic happens because you're not dabbling in poisonous foods that are addicting. You start, to stop, you stop wanting them and desiring them. Over time, you desire this less and less. It's keeping yourself in both worlds, always dabbling in junk food and, and unhealthy food that keeps you desiring it. Once you're off smoking for a year, you don't want to smoke anymore. Stay away from alcohol. Don't dabble in it. Don't just have alcohol on the weekends because if you're an addict and you're significant overweight, the little bit of alcohol could drive you into wanting to have more. And if you're, a, if you're an overeater and you're overweight as it is, a little bit of eating the cake and the processed foods and the fast food, the strides and the chips and the junk food is going to drive you to want to eat more. Break that cycle of addiction. Jump with both feet into the boat. 
and row it, you know, and stay with this plan. In other words, take the initiative to get started. Learn more. Become dedicated. Learn. Repeat the right way of eating over and over again. And then learn the recipes more. And you'll see, you take the initiative and dedicated with repetition, you'll learn to love eating this way. It'll become the way that you prefer to eat. And I eat this way. I love eating this way. It's the way I prefer to eat. I don't prefer to eat unhealthy food thinking it tastes better. I prefer to eat my healthy food recipes because I think that those taste better. I enjoy eating healthfully more than the foods that you think you might be missing. I know there are some people out there and say, shoot me right now if I have to eat this way. I'd rather be dead than having to live on healthy food like that. That's your food addiction talking, right? Because this anxiety that's provoked by giving up something, this idea, this is part of your primitive brain that doesn't like the idea of change and makes you want to think that it's impossible for you to change. You have to right now move past that because right now we're in a unique place in human history where these, even when COVID passes, a new more dangerous infection will come up again after that. We're seeing a real troubled time for the human species. And only you, and you have to protect yourself and your loved ones. And that means you have to use this information. You're so lucky to have the people that are on your team, the people that, are, that you're working with and for, care about you enough to want to make sure you have great health and you have a good, happy, and healthy future. And only with knowledge can you have a happy and healthy future. You don't want to have happen to you what happens to other Americans. Are there, this person, Darcy asks, is there any specific macronutrient parameters like more fat, more protein, how much protein, how much fat, what's the balance you should eat? Did I recommend? No, absolutely not. Get rid of that way of thinking. The idea that's all the brainwashing nonsense you've heard. This diet's good because it's higher in protein. This diet's good because it's carbohydrate. This diet's good because it's more fat. More fat's good, less fat's good, more protein's good. No, it's not about the macronutrient ratios. Lots of acceptable macronutrient ratios. It's the micronutrient content of your diet. It's micronutrients per calories that matters. Your protein and your fat and your carbohydrate will kind of take care of itself. Whether your diet is 15% of calories and fat or 40% of calories and fat, doesn't matter much, as long as you don't eat too many calories. Whether your diet is, whether you're taking in, well, you do need a certain amount of protein, but you don't have to worry about that. You're getting between 30 and 40 grams of protein per thousand calories. Pretty much you don't have to worry about that, no matter what you eat unless you're eating a diet too high in fruit, too high in rice. You're not eating a fruit-based diet or just eating nothing but like white potatoes and rice. By eating these beans and greens and nuts, you don't, have, you don't have adequate. So don't have to worry about macronutrient ratios or macronutrient adequacy. You have to worry about optimizing micronutrients and the rest will take care of itself. Would nutritarian requiring more calories naturally have a higher fat percent intake? I don't know what that means. But a nutritarian requiring more calories. Oh, would a nutritarian, like an athlete, like a professional athlete requiring more calories, naturally, behind, yes, have a, have a higher fat. That's correct. Like if you have a, some professional athletes eat this way, lots of professional athletes eat this way. Um, for example, um, Venus Williams got rid of her Sjogren syndrome and got back on the tennis court. And you have people like Kyrie Irving and Tom Brady and, you know, and, um, all, and all the top tennis players in the world are super healthy eating. Djokovic and, and, um, Roger Federer and even even um, Nadal and, and and Murray eat really healthfully. Or need, you know, so Murray, you know, though I have world class skiers I advise, like Eric Schlapp, he was in four Olympic games eating carrying his blender. You know why he ate all the salads and all the blended and the, the greens and carried them to Europe because they didn't want to get sick. They want to resist their body against infection against viruses. They can keep their training and not get burned out, and not get sick, and reduce their ability to continue to get better. And if you out for a few weeks with an illness, you're not going to be on top in the world and you're when a, when a tenth of a second could be a difference between coming in first and, and 15th and they're getting the big salaries based on how they're making their top position. And just to show you that Eric was in four Olympic games and he kept the top of his game for 16 years being one of the top Olympic skiers because he ate so healthfully and just like why Tom Brady are, are um, taking good care of his health. Even LeBron James is eating better and taking care of his health. And you look at basketball players like Zion Williamson, now in the Pelicans, I think, who's overweight, who's addicted to fast foods, who's never, who wouldn't want to put your money on him for a long career, because he's going to burn out his knees and bodies with the extra weight. He's not taking good enough care of his health. We're talking about here, us, us being, you know, us, we're, now that we're in our mid-60s, we want to enjoy playing basketball and volleyball and tennis and climbing mountains and swimming and surfing and, and skiing. We want to enjoy our lives as we get older. 
not be a couch potato. And the only way you can do that is if you eat healthfully. Otherwise, your cartilage and your back, your whole body just goes, gets destroyed. This is all about having fun in life. Having a balanced life. Yes, but if you're an athlete and you're getting more calories from nuts and seeds and your fat percent goes up more, that's fine because you're burning the extra fat calories with exercise. That's correct. So a nutritarian eats a high variety of high nutrient, oh, large variety of high nutrient plants foods, avoids the empty calorie junk foods, sugars, sweeteners, flours, processed foods, commercial baked goods. And you guys may have heard, I wrote about this extensively in my book, Fast Food Genocide that the more fast food and commercial baked goods you eat, higher risk of depression. Even two servings a week of commercial baked goods, like croissants or donuts or cookies, doubles your risk of developing depression. And it goes up from there in a dose-dependent manner. Almost all Americans are dysthymic, no longer excited about life, no longer passionate, no longer creative, no longer loving, and they lose, it hardens them. Their diet hardens them, makes them less compassionate, more selfish. And the, idea, the ultimate of selfishness is a drug addict. They could steal, cheat, kill, anything to get their addictive needs. But the more you're an addict, food addict, the more you gotta go off the fast food, overeating, the more food drives your behavior, the more addicted to donuts and coffee and, drink, and eating more garbage in your life, the less caring you are for other people. The less ability, because you're addictive, meeting your addictive needs and fueling your body's desire for addictive substances, drives your behavior, and that becomes the important driver of your life, and you just become a shell of an individual who's in prison. Your addictions keep you in a prison of poor health and self-consumed thinking, right? It's narcissistic thinking due to your food addiction because addicts are narcissistic because they're addicts because meeting their addictions matter anything else, more than their kids, more than anything else around them, more than being, having goodwill for others. What matters most to them is meeting their addiction. So you have a, so this is a, a full, um, how could you say, opportunity, a full opportunity for people. It's not that hard to do. It's what you see, what you see, eating at least a half a cup of beans a day, maybe in soup or a stew or a chili or a bean burger, eating at least three, three fresh fruits a day, eating at least an ounce and a half of raw nuts and seeds a day because we're losing the studies that show that nuts and seeds as a source of fat instead of oil has such a major effect at enhancing lifespan at least one large salad a day, some cooked greens or frozen or walked vegetables each day too, with mushrooms and onions, trying to make sure you're including the full, you could say symphony orchestra playing in harmony, creating this magic in your body. Like here's an example of John who I saw in 1994 at age of 72 with triple vessel heart disease, whose cardiologist told him he had urgent angioplasty, right? I, con I convinced my I begged with him. I haven't had my books weren't out back then in 1994. I didn't have that much, you know, punch for people to believe what I said. But I convinced him, John, follow my program for three months. You won't need the angioplasty. Once you put a foreign body in your heart, you can't get it out. It's a nidus of inflammation. It's going to cause you risk of increased risk of heart attack forever. You have to be on blood thinning drugs for the rest of your life. Now you put that, and it's going to increase your risk of hemorrhagic stroke. You don't want to put that stent in. Stents are a scam. They make you worse, not better. Get rid of your chest pain, lower your blood pressure. And he changed his diet and he did. He went back to his cardiologist three months later and the cardiologist said, I never saw this in my whole life. How your stress test could have improved so much. Never saw a person with reverse heart disease. Of course not, you didn't do it. Because you don't change people's lifestyle. You just give them a drug. And of course he's alive today. What I'm sure he's, of course, of course, he's, what is, 98 years old. The point I'm making is, as you move forward with good health, right? Years go by and you get healthier and healthier. The blood pressure doesn't go up with aging. Like Steve and Tara. The, the numbers mean Steve, Tara weighed 226 with lots of illnesses like you know, bronchitis and sinus infections and allergies and asthma and depression and, and skin disease. And of course, Steve weighs 447 pounds. Tara lost 80 pounds that first year. Steve lost 220 in one year, 300 pounds between the two of them in one year. The daughter Chloe got lost 30 pounds and got rid of their asthma. They're new people. These people don't even look alike. You can't even recognize the same people anymore. And you know who's really thrilled about this? Super duper thrilled? The dog. Take a look. He's got finally got some room to sit in the car. Of course, the point is, is so many people, so many hundreds of people have dropped 50 to 100 to 150 pounds. They've gotten their health back. They're off their drugs. Their autoimmune hepatitis went away, their lupus goes away, their psoriasis goes away. Here's Emily, not only did she get well, 
more of her medical problems, but take a close look up of her face one year later after she lost more than 100 pounds. Look how much younger they look. And we measure their telomeres, we show they actually did get younger because the telomeres now show a more youthful body with healthier telomeres, which measures your biological age. People are getting on, look at the skin tone and the penetration of the skin with carotenoids, which protects you against skin cancer. What I'm saying right now is that, sure, the, these, these um, blue zone areas live somewhat longer, but they're doing it by somewhat cultural and with foods that are raised there in those areas, they eat by luck and socialized and what they're you know, culturally eating. The Nutritarian diet, of course, is designed with science using the best of all the blue zones and using the best science has to offer to design to maximize human lifespan and to also use the best, obviously, cooking techniques from around the world and with famous with chefs and, and you know, making food taste great, allowing us to be able to have access to delicious and fresh produce and frozen food all year round that most of the blue zones didn't have not have access to. We have access to better food in our, in, with supermarkets and organic and everything else. And we didn't have sprouts and microgreens and baby kale and this and that and frozen pomegranate kernels and all kinds of things we can get. Wild blueberries you can get in your diet. You couldn't have a potential to eat this healthfully even 40 or 50 years ago. Eating healthfully today could help our world, help us individually and protect your life and your happiness. And when you're on an American diet, you don't just die younger, your life deteriorates, you become a medical cripple, and you somewhat don't have a high quality of life. The Nutritarian doesn't just live longer, they're living a so much healthier life expectancy, living longer, being younger, able to really fully enjoy their life as they age. Their golden years are enjoyable, like most Americans are almost couch potatoes and have very, and deteriorate, lose their mental function, and life becomes not so enjoyable, especially if you're in a nursing home somewhere. Do the right thing. Take care of your loved ones, obviously. Be a role model. Positively influence the people around you. And obviously, take good care of your health. All right, everybody. That's my message for today. I'm going to exit the screen and still continue to stay on with you and take your questions in the chat box if you have any other questions. So anybody could unmute themselves to ask a question or they can add a question to the chat box because we have about seven minutes left. Okay, I unmuted anybody. I've unmuted people. So you can unmute yourself if you'd like. Yeah. All right, good to speak to you guys today. And I hope you can share this message with people, with your loved ones, with your families, with your fellow workers and team members. And any particular questions you want me to answer? There was a, uh, in the question and answer box down below, and I, I uh -huh. can actually read it to you. The first question is, is water still the best choice of beverage? And how about green tea or matcha tea? Those are all options. We just don't want people to put sweeteners to use tea and add sugar to it. We don't want people to have liquid sugars. So if you enjoy some kind of tea or herbal tea with minimal sweetener or mix a little bit of berry in there, or a little bit of piece of banana in there if you want. In other words, don't, have, don't add sugar to liquids. That's the only issue there. We make some great drinks like alcohol, like they taste like alcoholic beverages here at the retreat, which we take, a, we take either a passion fruit vinegar or a pomegranate balsamic vinegar. We put about a teaspoon, excuse me, a tablespoon in the bottom of your cup with ice cubes, and then we fill it with, a, with, a, with sparkling water, with a carbonated water, and fizzes up with a, with a foam on the top. And you drink, it doesn't sound that good to say, you put vinegar in carbonated water and that's supposed to take like champagne or wine, but yeah, you got to try it. It tastes incredible. Don't like, don't think about this until you've actually tried it. It tastes fantastic. So we make, I mean, of course, herbal teas are okay. And some green tea is okay. Those are all good options, but just the idea is not to put sugar in your drinks. All right. Okay. There's a question there. Why do you consider alcohol a macronutrient? No, I don't consider alcohol a macronutrient. Um, certainly, it's a source of calories, but alcohol is carcinogenic. In other words, it causes cancer in the proportion that you use it. And no alcohol is better than a little alcohol, and a little bit of alcohol is better than more alcohol. So it's just like eating burgers. It's just like eating white bread. 
it's not good for you to eat alcohol unless you eat the better. And if you eat none, that's the best. You can, there are some people say there's resveratrol in red wine and some and the French paradox and all this stuff, but the real data shows it's not really true that alcohol is not making people live longer and alcohol is actually a risk factor. This is a risky thing that we should be trying to avoid. What about Greek yogurt? Greek yoga, is that where you, is that, I thought yoga, I mean, that you get in those positions with your legs and you do Greek yoga? No, just kidding. I'm trying to make it so people are eating less dairy products. Certainly fermented dairy, like yogurt, would be a better choice than eating milk and cheese, yes, but it's still better to eat mostly vegetables. And we're saying if you're eating some small amount of animal product, ideally keep that percent of animal product below 5% of total calories. So we have a use, use animal product as a flavoring or a condiment if you want a small amount. But for many people, they do better going completely vegan because it gets rid of those choices that doesn't drive them to want to eat more of those foods. So we're talking about minimizing animal products to very low levels if you're used, still utilizing them. I'm worried it's too late in my 60s. That's why we're talking here about such nutritional excellence, because it would be too late to just to moderately improve your diet and eat more vegetables. You gotta go all the way and jump with both feet into this nutritarian dietary portfolio, because that's when the miraculous magic happens and the body can institute all the self-repair mechanisms. It's not too late. You're listening to this. You're not dead yet, you're right? You're, you're actually writing on a chat box. You must still be alive. If you're living, it's not too late. I always say, Food doesn't taste that great once you're in the coffin. You get that? When you're alive, you know, make so eat healthfully, do the best you can, and let's see you transform your life. And I'm so excited you're listening, you come onto this program. And I'm so excited that these, this organization, this business that you're on, on this, that you're participating in, thinks enough about their workers to pay me to come and speak to their workers. Such a beautiful thing. So wonderful that they did this for you guys and to introduce you to this. And I hope you take advantage of this opportunity and take it further and really apply what you're learning to your life. And the fact that if you have other people that you know or that are in this business, you can have potluck dinners and groups and you could support each other. And you could see, and if you're overweight, people could, you know how smokers get support and alcoholics get support if they're trying to get off their alcohol and trying to get off their cigarettes, but who's giving you support when you're trying not to eat oil and junk food and sugar and stuff and getting off your burgers and your pizza? Nobody's giving you support. They're actually making it hard for you. Say, what are you doing that for? You eat like a rabbit the rest of your life, I'd rather be dead. So it's so wonderful that you guys can support each other. It's not too late. What's my thoughts on mushroom powders dissolved in hot beverage? I think those are great. I think adding more mushrooms is a great way Whether it's dehydrated mushrooms. It's a great anti-cancer effects. Eating a variety of mushrooms or using mushroom powders are tremendously effective and they help with the weight loss too because mushrooms have anti-fat storage effects. They help you lose weight, all great stuff. Are my in local in the Leesburg, Florida? No, I'm in San Diego, California. My retreat where people come in and stay with me for two to three months to get healthy. But there's lots of healthy people doing a nutritarian diet in Leesburg. I've lectured there, and there's even groups in, in Leesburg. There's even a group of um, an elderly community, a 55 and older community, where I've lectured to that have big nutritarian and whole food plant based clubs where a lot of people eat this way in your area. So you're going to get a lot of support. A side berry, all berries are great for you. Golden berries, a side berries, all types of berries are great foods. I go in the woods and I look for incredible berries and little wild berries that people get. There's all types of things we can, that you can find in primitive, little, you can get um, pine nuts in the woods. You can all eat, this. yes, all these unusual foods are incredibly good. Avoid bread, do you mean, because they say wheat is better, is that true? What I'm saying here is that if you eat bread, certainly only eat 100% whole grain. That's first of all. But the best type of bread is the one that's sprouted or intact, not ground into a fine flour. Because even some of those whole wheat breads, 100% whole wheat, they grind the flour, it's like a pastry flour. So it's like talcum powder, it's so soft, which increases its glycemic effect and exposes its surface area to the baked bread. Like the brands that are most favorable, are like the Food for Life Ezekiel breads that are made for like sprouted grains that are more hearty or the manna breads that are in the frozen section of Whole Foods or Publix or the frozen section of some of the um, better markets. What I'm talking about is that, yes, we want to eat less bread, but if you do eat bread, don't eat much of it and eat certainly a healthier bread that's made of a whole intact grain or sprouted grain with no added salt and sugar. Okay, um, like we'll use a little bit of a pita or a little bit of a, of a even we use a cauliflower wrap or a collard green to wrap it. When we're using, you know, a, a whole wheat wrap, we're just using a little bit of the wrap and it's stuck with mushrooms and avocado 
avocado and sprouts and tomatoes and delicious pesto sauce made with roasted garlic, a lot of roasted garlic mixed with some hemp seeds and cashew nuts. And with pesto sauce, a squeeze of lemon, a little mustard in there, make a little basil and make a different pesto sauce in the wrap. And you put the wrap with roasted pepper and mushrooms and sprouts and tomatoes and red onion. You wrap it up and you put in some silver and have a great meal for the plane. Right? There's a little bit of, you know, things we're using the grain for the wrap and a light amount of it. Most of you. What about eggs? The same thing. We're trying to eat people, mostly plants, not animal products. And the cholesterol, those yolks of the eggs, those are particularly sensitive in people who are overweight, raising the risk of diabetes. And raising that they are diabetic, increasing the risk of death from diabetes. So we're also minimizing all animal products to more to lower levels, so you're not going to push up your IGF-1 too high. So if you're a person that's, you know, so if we use any animal product you want to use, we have to keep that to a, a relatively lower level so we can keep our IGF-1 favorably below 150. We don't want to drive it up IGF-1 too high, so we want to age slowly. And for most people who have heart disease, obesity, propensity for cancer, have eaten unhealthily, it's probably simpler. And that's what we do with this retreat. We bring people in, we keep them on a strict vegan diet, we teach them how to make it taste great, and they really are learned that, that they, can, they can learn that they can, their taste buds adapt and they can start loving eating this way and can watch magically how they're dropping some, you, very frequently, 20 pounds leaves them the first month, 15 the second month, 10 the third, they drop sometimes you know, 20, 35, 40 pounds within two or three, within three months. And their, their blood pressure gets better, the diabetes resolves. It's so amazing to watch these people go get better. It's miraculous. So don't, before we leave, I'm just saying to you, don't underestimate the incredible self-repair and healing properties inherently already designed in your body. When you put in the optimal environment, your body does the magic. All right, a pleasure talking to you guys today and hope we can stay in touch. You can send me some feedback, letters, emails, collectively put something, show me how you guys are doing, support each other. And certainly I'm here to help in the future if you need me for anything. If you want, I also do questions and individual questions and answers from my medical staff and myself in the member center at drfirman.com if you need my personal advice about anything. You're welcome, thank you so much. Take care everybody. Thank you. Good luck.